Sir. Today, our guest is Gary Huswit. Gary is a director, photographer, producer, and a documentary filmmaker. Uh, his first film, Helvetica, a documentary about the typeface, uh, premiered in 2009 and formed the beginning of his design trilogy, a sequence of films about design directed by him that included Objectified in 2009 and Urbanized in 2011. Um, Gary has a new documentary called Rams about the renowned German industrial designer Dieter Rams that we're going to be talking about today. So Gary, hello and welcome hey. to Salon Talks. Thanks. Um, how are you doing today? Good. Good. <laughs> Um, glad, to be, glad to be back in New York. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a cold day to be here. It's <laughs> right in the middle of this cold snap. Um, so, okay, so to start, uh, I thought maybe I, I just ask you a little bit about Dieter Ram's design. I think that probably not everybody has, probably almost everyone in America has touched or seen one of his, something that he has designed, but may not know his name. Sure. So, um, like, just to start, like, what are some of the products that he helped design that we, or things that he helped design that we might recognize. Yeah, um, well, you know, he was the design director at uh, Braun, the um, German um, consumer products company from uh, the early 1960s till the kind of mid 90s. So right. he was responsible for the design and, or the design team that um, made all the Braun coffee makers and razors right, and right. radios and alarm clocks and watches. I mean, over 500 different products. So. Um, you know, I, I remember being a, like a, a kid in California, and my mom had the bronze juicer, the orange juicer that you yeah. push down on. I think my parents had that too, actually. Yeah, yeah. It, it's there's just you know these common sort of like utilitarian products that um, a lot of us had uh, that really kind of shaped how a lot of modern products sort of look and and function. Yeah. They were very simple. You didn't really need a user manual to operate them. They were really kind of um, clear uh, in, in terms of the design and the, and the way you interacted. But then um, Gillette bought Braun in the 1970s. Right. And um, so then Gillette started uh, also using Braun's design team to kind of help um, design products. So yeah. things that uh, Gillette and then Procter and Gamble, which is like the you know subsequent parent company, right. um, made were like the Oral B toothbrush. Um, mm -hmm. Dieter and his team were, were involved in the design of that. So right. chances are, even if you don't know it, like at some point this week, you've encountered something that um, was either designed by um, Rams or, uh, or or inspired by. I mean, right. Apple is the kind of um, you know perfect example of a company that has talked about the influence that Dieter had on the design of the iPod and the iPhone right. and the, um, the iMac. You can look at a lot of their um, design and, and, and see the influences that um, came from Dieter, from what, yeah, what yeah. his team was doing at Braun in the, in the 50s and 60s. Right, right. So, so essentially, uh, Rams at Braun was sort of like, you know, he was sort of to modernist design what um, Apple is to kind of postmodern design period that we're in, in a sense, like where they were making these very clean, minimalist type, type yeah. products for a mass consumer well, audience. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that when they started, it wasn't probably a mass audience. I mean, this is like mm -hmm. post World War II Germany in the mid '50s, and yeah. stuff didn't look like clean and white, yeah. and um, you sure. know, yeah, they didn't have that look yet. Well, there's yeah. this, this kind of um, post-war, I mean, in kind of the wreckage of, um, you know, Germany and Europe post-World War II, there was this sense among the younger generation, Rams was like 13 when the war ended, yeah. um, of, of rebuilding and kind of sweeping away uh, all the chaos that it kind of their parents' generation had, had um, yeah. you know, had, had done. So, um, this idea of trying to make like democratic, honest mm -hmm. products that were like, um, uh, you, you know, didn't look like the stuff from the 40s and 30s. Right. Um, and, and just trying to kind of, um, I don't know, bring Germany into this sort of modern design world. It, it's like when, when Braun first started making um, radios and, and, and other um, products that were kind of this new post-war um, design, mm -hmm. they would photograph them with like an Eames chair and a yeah. Herman Miller table. And, and right. they were basically kind of, um, you know, part of that. I don't know this new way of of, yeah. of living, or that that yeah. that the young generation then in the in the fifties wanted this new kind of way of life. Right. Um, they didn't right. want what had come before. Right. Um, so this right, is right. it's all it's all kind of tied in with that. Interesting. Interesting. So then, 
you know, obviously you've been very interested in design and, and uh, you know, filmmaking, making documentaries about design. And uh, I'm curious, uh, you know, because you previously had what made what you call the design trilogy. And this, but this film is also about design. So, like, I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you're sort of, like, are you amending that to be a quadrilogy <laughs> now? Or is it sort of a separate no. film from the previous uh, Helvetica Objectified Urbanized Tri yeah, trilogy. I mean, those films were, were um, kind of thematically linked and yeah. also sort of um, formally linked. They were all these kind of almost collages of different people and different ideas and kind yeah. of synthesizing that all into one, one film and one kind yeah. of statement. Um, whereas this is much more an exploration of one one person. Right. You know, everything I, I do is builds on something that I've done before. So there are mm -hmm. um, definitely... Um, in terms of the filmmaking and yeah. the kind of you know um, the visual aesthetic and yeah. the sound and everything like that, there there are things that connect it to those films. Mm -hmm. But um, but I wasn't trying to make like objectified two. Sure. Uh, even though um, the two films definitely share a lot of uh, questions and ideas yeah. and um, topics together, it's it's a different type of film since it's one person, yeah. the Dieter, but also the. Um, that just the construction of it and, and just the, 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 I was trying for simplicity. I mean, mm -hmm. Rams' this whole thing is about simplifying technology and simplifying our lives. So I wanted yeah. the film to be as simple as possible. Right. It's really hard to make a simple film or a right. simple design period um, yeah. that accomplishes all the things that, that you want. But, sure. um, but that was my goal to make like a simple, simple film. Um, and I don't think I, I achieved that, but um, but it was something I strove for. Yeah, uh, the design trilogy films were not were not that. They were right. just kind of all over the place and right. um, these kind of almost surveys of design of different design disciplines and like I don't know how those things affected our lives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Well, and in and in uh, Rams, you know, it's kind of a mix of what looked like archival footage and older videos and and, and television. Uh, interviews and news about Dieter Rams and Braun? With, like, some um, I mean, there's stuff. archival photos. There, there isn't yeah. really that much footage of, um, from, that, from that era. There's right. only one existing film clip of Dieter um, from, from the 1970s. Oh, that's but, interesting. Um, I guess I got the impression that there was sort of, he was a mini celeb, like, maybe not quite in the Joni Ive level, but it seemed like people knew who he was at the time. No, Is that not true necessarily? No. I, don't, I don't think people knew who d individual designers like were, especially, yeah. um, well, I mean, a, a big company like Braun, they definitely kind of put him, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the spotlight as this sort of, you know, um, face of their their design team. Yeah. But um, but outside of the design trade, I don't think people really really knew. Yeah. And and Dieter was never a um, a self promoter. Yeah. You know, he just wanted to be, you know, back in the in the in the sh in the workshop, you know, making things. Right. Uh, and working right. with his team, so he wasn't like, uh, you know, out there pushing his own image. Mm -hmm. So I think even it's interesting. People know the the products, but even I think mm -hmm. even in Germany, people don't really know him by name. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And partly because he's just. He's a private person. He doesn't sure. he doesn't you know doesn't do a lot of interviews, and yeah. it took me months to convince him to do you know to do the film because right. he'd already turned down you know so many um, yeah. you know, offers to do a documentary about him. So. Right, right, yeah. So what was it like? I mean, so you must you know know him a little bit now, or what was it? What was it like uh, that filmmaking process once you finally got to you know got got him to talk to you or interview him i mean did you, were you with him would you interview him for a while or hang out with him at his house and stuff yeah yeah like like this is in 2015 when we um first uh, agreed when he agreed to do the film and mm -hmm. um that year like I, I went over a couple times to um to you know he lives outside frankfurt so i went yeah. over for like week long trips where we do these long you know conversations and mm -hmm. try to get his full kind of story. Yeah. Um, at that point, I didn't really know what the structure of the film was going to be. Sure. I just wanted yeah. to um, do a lot of conversations, do a lot of filming with him, and try to follow him around to you know any kind of events or things mm -hmm. he was doing. Mm -hmm. um, and then I just sort of trusted that at some point the kind of structure of the film or the yeah. the, the the kind of themes would would. Um, would kind of emerge. Sure. Um, I think yeah. that's been my process with with all the films. I don't have some you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, strategy or brief no that I'm going in trying to like. Oh, here's right. what I'm gonna. Here's the story. Like they're explorations. Sure. Like I want to sure. go. I want to use documentary film to explore these subjects. Yeah. And I get to learn about them, and you know, I get to meet these people, and then the byproduct of that 
those conversations mm -hmm. and the exploration is is the movie. Yeah. Um, so so the process was like lots of interviews. Dieter yeah. in English or German, I should ask. Um, in German. In German. So yeah. and, and I, I don't speak I don't speak German. Yeah. But uh, but I had an incredible group of German designers and mm -hmm. writers and people that Dieter knew and that I knew and that were bilingual. So we um, we always had somebody else in the room to kind of help facilitate the conversations. Yeah. And Dieter's English is fine, but I think yeah. these long interviews he really wanted to do it in German. Sure. Sure. He's 86. He gets a little bit, you know, um, tired of switching back and forth between the the, the two languages. So, right. um, so yeah, there were uh, conversations, and then um, just the the like I said, he is a very private person. He and his yeah. wife, so they're not going out and doing lots of things. Over the four years that I um, was interviewing him and, and making the film. I think he went to like five public events and, oh, and four wow. of them are in the film. Yeah. So if you watch the movie, it seems like he's jetting between, you know, one exhibition to the next meeting to yeah. this thing. Yeah, right. But yeah, it was, was only like one one thing a year almost. Yeah. Um, so a lot of it was uh, partly me figuring out what the film was going to be and partly, yeah. um, you know, w w allowing uh, the time for you know, yeah. Dieter to kind of naturally want to do these events and then we would go film them. Right, right. Um, I wanted to ask you about um, the design principles, the 10 design mm -hmm. principles that he articulates in the movie, because that's one of the most, um, you know, uh, one, one of like the, the climax of the film is, is this, this uh, visual explication of Dieter Ram's 10 design principles with his voiceover and with some sort of like um, typography going across mm -hmm. that's elucidating each one. Yep. So like it wasn't, I actually hadn't heard of his, I hadn't heard of his design principles before I watched it, but it's very, yeah. You know, it's a very kind of like um, they're very simple, even the way they're articulated. Um, so, like, was that? Um, yeah, I, I want I want to hear you describe them or talk about like uh, that that elucidation of design that he. Yeah, has. sure. Well, I mean, he he, you know, in the in the kind of mid seventies to mid eighties, basically, you know, came up with these ten ten principles. Yeah. There. Um, you know, these basic guidelines to you know his philosophies of, of design and and mm -hmm. his team at. On uh, their, you know, their philosophies. Yeah. So, um, he, he, you know, he says that they weren't meant to be these like commandments. They were just he calls them friendly suggestions. Sure. Um, but since the '80s, they have been kind of taught like they are these kind of like in immutable laws of design. Yeah. Um, I mean, they're fairly open ended. Some of them are like good design is honest and good design yeah. is aesthetic. <laughs> and they, like, and, and right. he, he you know expands on 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 each of these the principles um, in text. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, for the film, you know, we wanted to do something, I don't know, some, some sort of a treatment that incorporated the objects themselves. Mm -hmm. He, he uh, over time, has selected a group of objects that he feels they embody that principle. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So we, we've incorporated some of those objects in use into that piece. Sure. And then um, uh, Trollbach and Company, which is a, a, a motion graphic studio and design studio here in, in New York, um, helped execute that uh, the piece. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, it's just a, a it's it's a, happens at a point in the film where it's just kind of almost set aside. It's, it's different than everything else in, in the film right. intentionally um, because we wanted them to kind of stand out or have this sort of um, you know, meaning unto themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. I mean, I, when, I, when I was listening to his design principles, it reminded me of like, um, like Le Corbusier, the architect's kind of like you know, design rationale or Frank Lloyd Wright's or something mm -hmm. like that, except for uh, you know, interior appliance design or, rather than architecture per se, but yeah. they seem to be, I, I never, I didn't know much about Rams, but I, it seems I could see him as being similar to like Le Corbusier or Frank Lloyd Wright, or I guess he had some relationship with the Bauhaus folks, so maybe well, Mies I mean, van der Rohe or something like that. Too. Well, he was inspired by the Bauhaus and then mm -hmm. like the kind of successor to the Bauhaus, which was the Ulm school. Yeah. You know, he, yeah. Braun and the Ulm school had kind of a, you know, working relationship where mm -hmm. students and professors at Ulm were helping um, with design work for Braun and, and yeah. um, you know, it's definitely inspired by, you know, the Bauhaus and those kind of, um, those sort of principles. Sure. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Um, and. You, you know, I know you've said in other interviews that you know you're you're not a designer, right? Like you didn't study design, but now you've become sort of one of the like preeminent documentarians who does documentaries about design. So, mm -hmm. uh, what was sort of the you know the genesis of like your interest in design, or your your like you know uh, you, you setting out to become this this um, design 
documentary <laughs> filmmaker? Um, yeah, well, it, it was sort of by accident. I mean, I didn't yeah. go to film school. I didn't really sure. have any desire to be a filmmaker <laughs> um, until I made Helvetica. Yeah. And, and that was just really a case of me as a kind of an appreciator of design and somebody mm -hmm. who, who was interested in it, um, wanting to see a movie about typography uh, yeah. and graphic design. Right. And there was just nothing out there. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that... that I, I think a lot of my creative process has been that that same kind of um, impulse. Mm -hmm. Like, why doesn't this exist? Like, I really want to watch or see or read or go to this yeah. thing, and it, it doesn't. It you know it doesn't exist. So um, you know, I find in those cases you just have to sort of roll up your sleeves and, and <laughs> do it. If no one else sure. is going to do it, and, and you and it, it's kind of um, you know an obsession. Yeah. Uh, you can't wait around for somebody else to, to do it and screw it up, probably. Right. Right. So I, I just feel like, well, you know, I didn't know how to make films, but I really wanted to watch a movie about fonts. And yeah, you know, all right, I'll teach myself how to be a filmmaker and, <laughs> right. and just make the documentary. But, um, but I, I'd been a fan of typography, I guess, from when I bought my first Macintosh in the uh -huh. late 80s yeah. and just started messing around with, you know, you know, DIY graphic design, basically. Right. And I always kind of used graphic design for, you know, I was working with record labels and I had an independent press, yeah. like publishing books. So we were always using, um, you know, fonts and, and, and graphic design for the projects we were doing, but I wasn't yeah. like a professional designer. But, but yeah. I read design magazines like Emma Gray and all this kind of stuff in, mm -hmm. the, in, the, in the 90s and 2000s. So, um, so it was something that I really liked, and I was—I just couldn't believe there wasn't yeah. a, a film about it. It was just insane. Yeah. And then, um, you know, what I found when I when I announced the film was there were a lot of people around the world who who were thinking the same thing. So, right. And that's the success of, of that. And then, the next film was just the same. I was like, wow, why isn't there a film about you know, product design, and industrial <laughs> design? Like, I like all these gadgets, and you know. Um, all these you know designers who who make this stuff, but I also wanted to kind of question, well, what's our relationship as the users of these things? Mm -hmm. You know, we we surround ourselves with all these objects. Like, who makes them? Why are we? Why do we have them? What's yeah. our this idea of like expressing our identity through the stuff we have in our in our home? Sure. Um, so those were the kind of questions that we sort of explored in, in um, Objectified, and then Urbanized was the same thing, but about mm -hmm. cities. Like, I'm just yeah. like. Your every day, from whatever, you know, from the point you wake up to the point you go to sleep, mm -hmm. your your life is kind of dictated by the design of your city. How you yeah. get to work, where you go to work, yeah. where you what you do after work, um, right. how you relax, how you have recreation, um, your health. All this stuff is is all woven into yeah. um, into the, your your environment. And, and as more and more people you know are moving to cities, and you know there are more people living in urban areas than you know suburban mm -hmm. areas now. Um, it's just going to be kind of more and more of a factor. So I wanted yeah. to look at that. So it's always about um, stuff that I'm interested in or stuff that um, I think there should be a film about, but yeah. it doesn't exist. And then yeah. uh, depending on my level of obsession, <laughs> I, I make the project. And, sure. and, and, and Dieter was the case, too. I right. really wanted to watch a film about Dieter Rams. I couldn't believe there wasn't one. Right, right. But there wasn't one because he didn't want to do one. Yeah. <laughs> and that, yeah, was yeah. The, that was the, the, um, the challenge with, with him was just like getting him to, um, to, to kind of to see that a film could do something different than mm -hmm. books could. Yeah. Or it could reach a different audience or a bigger audience than, than right. he had reached before. And I think it's really important for him now um, at this point in his career to like get his ideas and his philosophies to the next generation. So right. that's ultimately why I think he, he agreed to do it. Yeah. So, and at this point, you know, you've like, you spent years making these documentaries and you've interviewed a lot of designers of some sort or another at this, you know, over the years. Do, do you feel like we're in a historical moment where design is very interesting and innovative or do you feel like we've sort of stagnated since the mid century? I mean, one thing that I was really, it really struck me about Rams was like the products that Braun made in some ways are more durable than they're almost identical to the appliances we have nowadays, but more durable. Yeah. So I, I wanted to hear, I don't know, what, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, it, it's, it's complicated. Like, um, again, they were designing things to last your lifetime, even if yeah. it was a coffee grinder they made that coffee grinder to outlive you. Right. And, and if it did break, it was designed to be repaired and there was an infrastructure mm -hmm. to repair it. Yeah. And, and now that, that doesn't exist. Like if something yeah. breaks, if a 
household appliance breaks or you know even the button falls off or something it's like oh, oh god there was one on bad. sale black friday you know let's just buy i can get one yeah. for 20 bucks let's buy it um, so the, the, the philosophy just from consumers and I think manufacturers and designers has, has totally shifted. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something I think Dieter is, is you know, kind of horrified at, but also yeah. kind of feels maybe a little bit partly uh, he had a role in, in that too, just right. in, in making all these things and making technology kind of like desirable. Yeah. Um, but I, I'd say there's more... Uh, <laughs> I'd say the digital side of our lives is probably even more um, problematic in yeah, terms of right, design. Right. Um, and I think it's one of the reasons that Dieter does not have a computer and doesn't do social media and doesn't have email mm -hmm. um, is just that he's all about simplifying. Mm -hmm. He spent his whole career thinking about how to simplify our lives with these right. objects and also right. kind of simplify his life. So while digital um, you know, technology has you know, done an you know an amazing amount of um, of capabilities that it kind of enables mm. us to do, like talk, have this interview right now, yeah, with, sure. and have people watching it. Um, it, it. Has it simplified our lives? Mm -hmm. That that's I think the the, the question for yeah. me. That you know, again, it, it's enabled us to do a lot, but it just has definitely not simplified our lives mm -hmm. to have this technology too. So I think that's a bigger challenge in mm -hmm. terms of design is how to. Um, you know, how to, how to use digital technology and the web yeah. and social media in, in a way that's, um, that, that does make our lives better, mm -hmm. um, but doesn't take over our lives or influence our lives in, in, a, in, a, negative, in a negative way. Sure. Um, so I think yeah. that's like the next 10 years, that, that's the question. Like, yeah. how do you mediate it? How do you kind of like... Um, you know, I think the past 10 years we've been just very like, oh my God, this thing, it does something new, let's do it, let's yeah. do it. And oh, my information, sure, here's all my information. And then we've kind of seen how, you know, things can, um, can uh, you know, maybe unseen sort of repercussions of, right. of giving all that information out. Right. Um, so right. now it's, it's not like, I don't think it's like about recoiling and not, not participating in, in mm -hmm. digital life, but um, I, I think the challenges are about how to do that in a way that's like beneficial to us yeah. and, and helps us live like, you know, better lives yeah. instead of become this like thing that we're just constantly thinking about and stressing right. out about and who's emailing me, what am I missing, all this kind of stuff. Sure. That makes sense. Well, <laughs> the, the documentary is called Rams, and how can people see it if they want to go out and see it? Um, so it's uh, in theaters right now it's in, in theaters, um, okay. New York, uh, London, uh, this week at least, in New York, London, Berlin, Copenhagen, Toronto, and Montreal. Um, and then it comes out this Friday on video um, through uh, my website and Vimeo. It's the first 30 days kind of exclusive through that. So people can, um, can watch it this Friday. Uh, Great. On their, on their digital devices. Okay, excellent. <laughs> well, Gary Hustler, thanks so much for being here. Thanks so much for being on Salon Talks. Thanks a lot. Yeah. <laughs> All right, take care.